Coming up next, we've talked about those rare hit songs that have been like lightning in a bottle. You know, where an artist or a band releases a song that just rips up the charts and shakes the earth for a time and then never rises to those levels ever again. But what about an entire album that does that? An album that rockets up the charts and has multiple hit songs and then never reaches those lofty heights again, not even close. Up next, an 80s icon tells us the story of a wondrous period where his band was the end-all be-all in music, with a number one album and two number one hits, and a new episode of Bottle Lightning, next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to write down the top 40 countdown in your Trapper Keeper as you listened to Casey Kasem counting them down, you're gonna love this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and click the bell so you get these stories from the artists about these songs. You won't find this content anywhere else. You can also become an honorary producer on our Patreon. That helps us to keep the music alive, keep the channel going. You also get awesome content uh, just for patrons. And also see our new merch uh, below as well. We have some new additions to the Vintage Years collection. It's time for another edition of our series, Bottle Lightning. Love this. This is where we break down the history of a beloved one-hit extravaganza that still resonates in our culture. This time, though, we're going to tweak it a little bit, and we're going to talk about it from the album side. You know, where an album blew up with multiple hit singles and then just never reached those earth-shattering heights again. This is kind of interesting to me. You know, you think about an album like Jagged Little Pill by Alanis Morissette or Crack Rearview Mirror by Hootie and the Blowfish. We're not going to cover those today. But it's interesting because both those albums came out around the same time. They both sold well over 15 million copies. 15 million copies. And then their next albums sold just 2 million each. It's kind of mind-boggling if you think about it. I'm not saying anything derogatory about either of these artists. It's just fascinating to me. You know, we'll tackle those later. But today I want to zero in on an album that was massive with multiple hits in the mid-80s. I've got the album right here at the actual album I bought with my own allowance. Love it. It was one of my favorite records of that time. You know, it had three top 10 hits, including two that went all the way to number one, but they were great number one hit songs. Uh, the album also hit number one in March of 86. You know, from 1985 to 1986, they were one of the biggest bands out there, and then they virtually disappeared from the charts just a few years later. Mr. Mister, led by one of rock's nicest and most humble guys, Richard Page, had two number one hits, like I said, Broken Wings and Curie. Take these broken wings. Also had a third hit, Is This Love, that went to number eight. I love that song. Is it love? Is it, is it love? All three of these hits were from their 80s scorcher, Welcome to the Real World, a record that uh, as a 10-year-old, I listened to it nonstop for months. Up next, Richard Page is going to tell us the stories behind these hits and the album. And then after that, we're going to try to solve the mystery of why the band never reached that top of the chart level again. Uh, so stay with us. We'll discuss that. As we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Since Zenny has been our sponsor, I tell you, I have received so many comments from our viewers who have uh, taken my advice and, and got, you know went and ordered glasses. They especially love the, the features, the blue blocks. These guys are the real deal. Go to zenny.com right now and get on board. Here's Richard of Mr. Mystery. Carrie, let's talk about that. The next number one song, which number one pop, number one on the rock charts as well, Canada, top 10 worldwide, just a smash. Tell me about uh, how that song came together. Again, the one that you wrote with, uh, with John, John Lang. And Steve George. Yeah. yeah. I'd had sort of the little da -da 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 thing worked out. You know, kind of melody and stuff. And, and John, called me up and he said, I got this idea. And I said, what? He goes, you remember Kyrie Eleison, you know, from the 
the the mass, you know, the, it's, it's Greek. And it was, if you've ever sung in a church choir, there's some version of Kyrie that, oh, yeah. you know, there's hundreds of them. He said, let's use that. And I said, why? <laughs> And I'd been raised singing in a church my whole life. And I did, really didn't you know, think that that was the right thing to do. For me, anyway, especially didn't want to be pigeonholed as a, as a Christian band or that, or that we were proselytizing or some, some misunderstanding. And I just said, no, that's not going to work. And he said, well, yeah. just try it. So we rehearsed a little bit and I sort of reluctantly sang it. And you know, we went in the studio and all of a sudden it just, it just became this thing. And you couldn't think of any other thing to call it or to, you know, any other lyrics to, to throw in there. It just was what it was. Honestly, if John hadn't twisted my arm, I, the song probably wouldn't have ever happen. The story about, I think it was, uh, Somebody approaching the supermarket and said, I love that Carry a Laser song. Tell us that. Carry a Laser. It was like some Spicoli looking guy, you know, out of Fast Times. Hey, bud, <laughs> let's party. And he was just like, hey, Mr. Mr. Right, you know, yeah. He said, I love that song, Carry a Laser. Well, I've told that story a bunch of times. And then now there's this, this movie that came out with Steve Carell called The Way, Way Back. <laughs> And they actually used that bit. All kind of drinking and singing and everything. Hey, hey, hey. Are, you, are you saying carry a laser? That's what it is. And the guy goes, no, it's not carry a laser. And they get into this argument. Why would anybody write a song called carry a laser? Because they like outer space. Well, it was just used in Goldberg's. Did you see how they used it on that show? No. The TV show? No. It was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. It was uh, kind of the same experience I had growing up because about a family in the 80s and this kid's about the same age I was, but it's kind of that same experience. So it was uh, pretty cool. You played SNL about that time. Do you remember playing Saturday Night Live? I do. It was great. John Lithgow was the, was the, uh, the host. Oh, I was just, you know, wow, iconic. Here we are, you know. Once again, Mr. Mr. <laughs> At that time, that was the hippest, coolest show on ever. Somebody told me later that Randy Newman called Lauren Michaels while we were performing, asking if we were really singing. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Somebody told me that. Wow. Because he, he thought that maybe there was some trickery going on or something. Carry a laser down the road that I must travel. Baby, don't understand. Why we can't just hold on to each other's hands. Let's talk about Broken Wings, which you were just saying that you didn't ever think that that was going to be a hit. How did that song come together? That album was an experiment. You know, we had just come from a very sophisticated kind of jazz fusion oh, yeah. thing. And it wasn't working. We had three albums and we had picked up a lot of fans in the music world, you know, mm -hmm. musos, uh, all over the world. There's little pockets still, like in Japan or in Sweden. They, they just, they worship that music. But it wasn't working commercially for us. And we really thought we had something to yeah. say. And so we kind of regrouped and we put Mr. Mr. together. We went after the coolest producer of the time, which is Peter McKeon, who had just come yeah. off of the Men at Work album. And we thought, you know, let's get a little his magic on our thing and, and it'll all work. Well, it was a good sounding record. It just nothing happened with it. So, but uh, a lot of the songs, I, you know, I still, I think that was sort of how we were getting our feet wet and starting to figure out who we were going to be. And strangely, when we got around to doing Welcome to the Real World, which was the, you know, the album that had the two big hits on it, I was sort of back to, let's just write great songs. Let's don't worry about getting the hit producer and trying to formulate the sound and everything. Let's just, let's do what we do. And that's what we did. And honestly, I never thought Broken Wings would ever be a hit. During that time as you were putting together the second album, my understanding is that you were offered a vacancy in two pretty big bands at that time that were looking for 
a bass player, singer, lead sing well, lead singer, but also in Chicago's position. Yeah. Chicago and Toto. Tell me about that. A lot's been made of that. And, you know, my name came up with a bunch of names as far as, you know, on a short list of people that would be good to replace Peter and um, Bobby Kimball. So that's really all it was. You know, I was being considered for those gigs. But you really wanted to focus in on... I just felt like we had something really strong, and I, I just didn't feel like it was time to abandon that. But, you know, John Lang and I, um, really close friends, went through a lot of stuff. Steve George, of course. And we got into the thing that everybody was doing at the time, which is doing tons of drugs and, you know, just yeah. partying and going to studio. I mean, you go into a session and guys would have these three gram vials of Coke, like sitting on their synthesizer, you know, and people were chopping it up. It was like, you know, if Freud used it, it's not addictive and it's a creative person's thing. Well, that's how we kind of all got into that. But of course, you know, we've seen the damage done and it really kind of like derailed me for seriously for a few years. Coming out of that and deciding that that wasn't going to be a, a part of our lives anymore was really what Broken Wings was about. And John had been reading Khalil Gibran. And a lot of, uh, he, you know, he's a big reader and, a, and a, he loves poetry and he loves spiritual type pithy kind of teachings. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to me and I had this thing worked out on the bass and the bass lick that you know and little sus chords and all that. The dum dum Yeah. Baby, I think tonight we can take what was wrong. Make it right. He just came over to my house and he was like, I think this will fit. This will, you know, and so it, it, that just sort of happened like that. But when we got into the studio, it really started to take shape. And, and I remember the vocal, when I did the vocal, it was one of those transcendent moments, you know, where everybody was kind of going, wow, this is, this is really something, you know. But it was so long, it was so long. And they were saying, you know, no program director is gonna play this, it's over four minutes. And it was five and a half or five something. We tried editing, we tried yeah. to, you know, to, to condense it, essentialize it, and it just didn't, it never worked. So finally, I think I just said, write four something on the box. At that time, <laughs> you would send a, like a, a half inch reel and they would, you know, they would do their dub and put it in their cart or whatever, you know, and play yeah. it on the radio. So nobody really checked, I guess, to see how long it was. You kind of pulled a little trick that uh, Phil Spector did oh, back did in the day. Oh, did he do that too? He did that with You've Lost That Love and Feeling. Oh, really? Back it was too said, long? It, it, but at that time, it was like, if this is over three minutes, they won't play. Right, yeah. And it became a number one hit, the same yeah. thing. Yeah, that's right. repeat it again. That's really yeah. cool. You're right about the, the short songs. My son was just... All of a sudden, he's into Ray Charles, and we we're listening to it in the car, and he was playing Hit the Road Jack. I mean, it was over before it began. It was like, well, hey, check it. He was like, yeah, two minutes and three seconds, you know. So it just got, got to the point, and that was it. Because of uh, what Phil Spector did, the Beatles released Hey Jude, which was another long song that right. went to number one. I know those guys didn't care at all. <laughs> if it was six minutes. So, Broken Wings, also the video was really iconic. Yeah, I remember seeing that video, it was kind of, I grew up in a small town, so it was my window to the world, mm -hmm. MTV, and that video is so iconic with the way it was put together. Did you have anything to do with that? Or Not did they really, kind of no, we hired a director, a video director, Oli Sasson, I think his name was. And he basically just came in and said, here's what I, how I see this song. And we looked at the storyboards and the thing, and we were, yeah, that's cool. So we just did it, and he didn't really expect much. You know, the song yeah. wasn't a hit yet. Well, and you fought to have that be the first song released from the album. Well, I don't know if I fought for it, but, you know, we had a meeting. There's so much history in, in this. You know, we were uh, at RCA when... Jose Menendez was there, uh -huh. who, you, as you know, was famously murdered by his, his two yeah. sons, who I met and knew, and, you know, and his wife, Kitty, and we, we were friends. We traveled around Europe together. But Jose was, um, was not, he, and he would admit that he was not a music guy. I think he came from 
Hertz rent a car or something, but he was an yeah. exec and he knew how to run a business. Mm -hmm. And we sat around in this meeting with Paul Atkinson, who's since passed, who was you know, a guitar player in the Zombies, our a &R guy, Paul was a great guy. And Paul and George, manager, myself and Jose, and we were like, well, what's the single gonna be? And we went this song and that tried to, tried to analyze why it would or wouldn't be a hit, you know, how you do these things. And finally, Jose, who really didn't know anything about music, he said, Richard, what's the best song in the album? I said, oh, Broken Wings. That's your single. <laughs> and that's how it happened. It's kind of, through the decades, been presented through pop culture in different ways. Grand Theft Auto, it's kind of the opening scene of that video game, <laughs> presenting it to a new generation. Vice City is 24 karat gold these days. The Colombians, the Mexicans, hell, even those Cuban refugees. Are Clay Aiken covered as well. Right. Take these broken wings. Rick Springfield. Oh, we've known each other forever. 35 years probably. You know, Rick, I, I met Rick when um, his producer, Keith Olson. Oh, okay, yeah. Keith Olson called me up and Tom Kelly, I think it was Tom, to come and sing on Rick's album. And that's, that's when we met. So we've just, you know, we've re remained friends over the years. There's a version of Broken Wings you guys sing yeah. together. Yeah, right. When we hear the voices sing. Richard Page's records are, it get more and more incredible. I've always loved his voice. I mean, he sang on, he sang background on, on, on my first, on Tao, on success and on uh, living in Oz. And he I always say he's had the voice I always wanted, you know, it's got <laughs> like that incredible richness. And, uh, and uh, I remember we were doing Tao actually, and he was doing the first Mr. Mr. album and, and was, you know, we we're talking about that, that he's, he finally got like a record deal. And uh, so I've always loved his voice. So we're still good friends and he yeah. sings occasionally on, uh, on, on my, my stuff. Um, yeah, a great version of Broken Wing, the two of you together. Yeah, right, right, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, he's a great, great singer, and, and, and his music just gets better and better. And his voice does, too. Love his voice. And then Tupac, Until the End of Time. Yeah. What did you think when you heard that? Wow, I was really impressed. I mean, I was honored, you know. I actually got to be a part of that. You know, I yeah. went down and, and did a guest vocal on it for one of the versions. That was cool. Perhaps I was addicted to the dark side. Somewhere inside my childhood when this my heart die. And even Actually, that got me some real street cred with my kids' friends <laughs> at school <laughs> at that time, you know. Oh, I'm sure. It's like, whoa, your dad and Tupac? Fascinating stuff, man. I love Richard Page, such a good guy. So let's talk about it. Why didn't Mr. Mister's next album called Go On, why didn't it become just as big as Welcome to the Real World? I mean, it came out in 87, less than 18 months after uh, Welcome went to number one on the album charts. Um, and in an interview, Richard Page felt that uh, that album Go On included some of the band's best songwriting. He also added that the band tried many new and different sounds and ideas. Well, for one, while I bought Go On with my allowance, the cassette, I listened to it a lot of times, it didn't have the surefire catchy hit on it. Uh, you know, in my opinion, there wasn't a deeply enthralling ballad like Broken Wings or that, you know, Raise Your Fist fiery anthem like Kyrie on it. But then again, not many hit songs from that moment or the years before or after could equal those two great hits. Something real inside me slash inside you was a good single, but it just didn't grab you by the ears or have you singing or humming the chorus. Yeah. And my theory is that on a follow-up album to a pop blockbuster in the 80s, it's all about that first single from the next album. You know, think Whitney Houston, I Wanna Dance With Somebody, after her self-titled debut in 85. or Prince Raspberry Beret after Purple Rain. There are some exceptions like you know, Michael Jackson, uh, Def Leppard, but you know, only if you have an album full of hit singles, which Mr. Mr.'s uh, Go On didn't have that. But Richard Page is still a great writer, and it's likely that he and his other co-writing bandmates, Steve George and John Lang, who I'd like to interview, 
they maybe didn't want to go in that direction, maybe a different direction. They didn't want to write a, a bunch of hit songs or, or hit a certain trend at that time. I don't know. I mean, before Mr. Mr. broke up in 1990, they did record a fourth Mr. Mr. album, Pull. Uh, this was in 1989. The album was not released until 2010, though. It was much more experimental. It's not like Richard Page lost the ability to write a hit song. I mean, he co-wrote Madonna's 1994 number two hit, I'll Remember. Great song, one of her best. Richard Page is just one of the great underappreciated artists of the 80s. He's like the Don Mattingly of pop music. Those of you who know Donnie Baseball will get that comparison. This one by Mattingly. Oh, hang on to the roof. So why do you think that Mr. Mr. never hit the, the top of the charts again after that? Let me know in the comments below. Let's have a really nice discussion about this. I think it's really interesting. What is your theory? Also, share your thoughts on these incredible 80s masterworks from Mr. Mr. Broken Wings and Kyrie. What are your memories of these songs? Two of the greats. Man, Broken Wings is probably in my top five of the 80s. Also, make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you get the story straight from the artist. And make sure to become an honorary producer on our Patreon. And uh, clicking the description, we have some awesome content going up there just for patrons. Help us keep the music alive. It's really the reason we're here. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon. Bye.